Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Kempe, Adult Services Coordinator with the King County Library System. Thank you so much for joining us this e for this evening's event with Malika Garib. Uh, before we get started, a little housekeeping. There are a couple of ways to participate in tonight's webcast. You can use the chat on the right-hand side of the screen to say hello. After the conversation, we'll have some time for audience questions. Uh, to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can also vote on other people's questions if you see one that you would particularly like to hear answered. Uh, we're grateful to the KCLS Foundation for their support of tonight's event and our ongoing author series. Uh, to help support foundation events like these, you can click on the donate button below. And to learn more about upcoming author events, please visit kcls.org forward slash author voices. And if you would like to purchase a copy of I Was There American Dream, uh, the link below will take you to our partner bookstore, Third Place Books. Um, I'm also putting a link to a survey about tonight's event in the chat. Uh, I'll post it again at the end of the program. So if you don't get it now, that, that's all right. And now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker and moderator. Uh, Malika Garib is a writer, journalist, and cartoonist. She is the author of I Was There American Dream, a graphic memoir, winner of an Arab American Book Award, and named, and named one of the best books of the year by NPR, The Washington Post, Kirkus Reviews, and the New York Public Library. Uh, by today, she works on NPR's Science Desk, covering the topic of global health and development. Her comics, zines, and writing have been published in NPR, Catapult, Seventh Wave Magazine, The Nib, The Believer, and The New Yorker. She lives in Nashville with her husband, Darren, and her dog, Shibu. Our moderator is Jo Anderson, she, her. She is the Social Impact Coordinator for KCLS's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department. Uh, jo identifies as multiracial Filipina and white and grew up in Bremerton, Washington, an ethnically diverse Navy town, and is co-founder of Western Washington University's Filipino American Student Association in a notably less diverse Bellingham, Washington. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Let's start the conversation. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Yes, Bremerton's in the house, and I had to give a shout out to Western's FASA and the Ethics Suit Center. So um, happy to be here. Happy to be here with you, Malika. Um, this is so exciting. So excited to talk about your book. But you are going to kick us off in a very special way by starting with a reading. So I'm going to hand it off to you to bring up your screen. And But first of all, um, I did bring my cat ah! Lego with me. <laughs> oh so, my god! So you for that really quick. Hold it up, really quick. Yes. Oh, I, my screen. One, two, three. I got it. All right, that's amazing. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm gonna tweet that. Um, <laughs> that. Um, thank you so much for having me, King County Library. What's the S for? Services. Um. Yeah. Uh, system, system. Systems. Mm -hmm. And also to Joe and to Jeff for having me here. Thank you so much. I'm so, so excited to be in community with all you are and share this space. Um, I just want to kick this off by like doing a reading. I think that like, I don't, I know, I don't know if it, like, tell me if you've read the book or not. I think some of you have, but like, it just sounds so much better when like you can hear it coming from me. So like, I'll, I'm, I feel like if you haven't heard the book, then maybe you can sort of get a sense. So I'm just going to go and read you the first chapter. I'm going to share my screen. It's going to be an awkward transition, but here we go. Can you see the screen, Joe? Yes. Okay, great. Here I go. Um, when I was growing up, my mom would always say, you have to be better than us. She never explained what she meant by that, but I understood. I had to somehow rise above my parents' life in America, but how? This is a story about that journey, and it starts before I was born. My parents immigrated to this country in the early 1980s. They met in Los Angeles. They had different ideas of what their lives in the States would be like. My mom never wanted to come here, but in her home country, of the Philippines, in the late 1970s, there was growing civil, civil unrest. People wanted President Ferdinand Marcos, who had declared martial law in 1972, out. I don't know what's going to happen to this country. We got to go. That's my tatai and my nanai and all of my siblings, uh, all of her siblings. Tatai, my grandpa, hatched a plan for the family to flee the country. One by one, he'd send each family member to America. 
Call us when you get a job and find a place to live. Then we'll send your sister. That's my Tito Ovid, and he was a doctor. I'm taking your room and the car. That's my Tito Maro. My mom, who was in her early 20s, didn't want to leave. She came from an upper middle class family, and life in Manila was easy. Aling Aurim, that's the name of their maid. Can you tell the driver I'll be ready in an hour? And please iron the dress in my bed. Thank you. She already had an awesome job. And everything you can get in the US, you can get in Asia. Records, like Simon and Garfunkel and Hall and Oates. Wrangler jeans, cool bags, Adidas. Why would I want to come to the United States to toil away, to cook my own rice, to cook my own food, wash my own dishes? I have to work hard to make a living. I have to start from the bottom. Here's my mom being served like a princess. Before she knew it, Tatai told her it was her turn to join my uncle in America. She was totally heartbroken. My dad, on the other hand, had been scheming to get to America since high school. Growing up in Cairo in the 1970s, he was obsessed with American movies. Here he is watching the movies with his friends, and his friends are like, this is lame, I don't want to watch this movie, but my dad's so into it. American movies inspired me, especially ones about New York, with all the high-rise buildings and the cars and the shops and the malls. Something inside me clicked and said, yeah, this is what I want, America. Not Europe, not Australia, not Canada, not Berlin, London, Paris. I want open sky. I want America. Dad's awesome plan to get to America. One, get Bubba's blessing. Bubba, I'm going to Egypt and leaving it. I'm, I'm leaving Egypt and going to America. Is that okay? Go for it, my son. Two, save money. Brother, can I stay with you in Denmark for a while to save money for my trip to the US? Okay. Hi, please buy this painting I made. Talk. My dad sold paintings in Denmark to make money to go to the States. Three, learn English. Hello, I am from Egypt. Where are you from? Four, pass the TOEFL, test of English as a foreign language. Four, apply for grad school in the US. Six, get accepted. Okay, inshallah, get in. Sir, you have a package. Oh my God. And then the last step is to get the visa. It took him over a decade to complete the plan, but he did it. Alhamdulillah, congratulations. You have been accepted to UCLA School of Management. He was going to America. Just as my mom predicted, life in America was tough. She had a job from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then she had a little break. And then she had another job from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then she was home at 9 p.m. Ugh, nothing to eat. Meanwhile, dad was anxious to get his career started. He was determined to make it here. MBA, huh? We'll start you out as a night manager. Yeah. There's my mom. She's working in the front desk with him. Dad was my mom's manager. Hey, uh, do you want to watch Indiana Jones with me after work? Who, me? No, the ghost at the front desk. Who else? She liked him because he was funny. He was always dressed neatly and he seemed smart. Oh my God, he's going to rip out his heart. They got married six months later and had me a year after that. Why is she so brown? Where are her blue eyes like her dad? Oh, well, I'll call her brownie. That's problematic, but I never really thought about it twice until I wrote that. And there they were, two immigrants and their American daughter in a strange new land. Here they are in a mall. And there's little squiggly me. They were on their way to the American dream. And to my parents, that meant a big house with a white picket fence, a two car garage, credit cards, a Mercedes Benz or a Lexus, annual trips to Disney World, Ralph Lauren polo shirts for the whole family. Kids were American, but not too American. Living at home until you're married is a great way to save money. 8 p.m. is a perfectly reasonable curfew for an 18 year old on a Friday night. Well, almost on their way, things were tense at home. What do you think about sending our brownie to Catholic school? My dad is reading a book called A Guide for Muslim Parents in America. That's a real book, and I found it in my dad's stuff. That skirt's too short. Can you wear something a little bit more modest? Antigas ang ulo mo. Inti saba. It both means you're stubborn in Tagalog and Arabic. Eventually, my parents got a divorce. I moved in with my mom. My dad got a job about a three-hour drive away. I would see him every other weekend. For my mom, life returned to the crazy, hectic life she had before me. Except now, she was a single parent, juggling a full-time job and thinking for two. Oh my god, Malka, please eat so I can go to bed. My parents had so many hopes for themselves. The reality was they were so far from what they wanted. 25 years later, my parents would tell me that being married to each other was the closest they ever got to the American dream.
Okay, I think I'm gonna, that's it, that's that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Hope you like the reading. I loved it. <laughs> and I love that that's how we started out because um, there's probably folks who have read the book mm -hmm. uh, and probably folks who have yet to read the book. Uh, but I just want to, I mean, it also gave us a sense because as you're reading it, like I read it in different order than you read it on some pages, right? Mm -hmm. I thought what was interesting is the book is an experience, right? Mm -hmm. You aren't reading like line by line, cover to cover. It's like things are happening. There's things to look at. There's lists, there's games, you know, there's all these different things. And it kind of put me in that space of being a kid. And it was kind of a relief to my pandemic brain too, mm -hmm. because yeah. I find it so hard to kind of do the traditional, you know, memoir which you know i love memoirs but this was so different you know it was something that kept me engaged and, and interacting and it was so relatable we had a chance to talk just briefly beforehand and when you asked to tell me uh about my tell you about myself i was like a lot of it's like you <laughs> and I, I read that in the book and i love how relatable things were and so my first question to you is how did the idea of writing your story come about and what were some of the joys and challenges of telling it in this format? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a very, very diverse part of Southern California called Cerritos, California. Um, in this part of the country, it was mostly um, Filipinos, Hispanic people, East Asians, and Indians. And um, I thought the whole America looked like that. When 9-11 happened, I was 14 years old. It, I was a freshman in high school. and I remember thinking, you know, um, I mean, the political stuff, maybe I was a little too young to understand like the anti-Muslim rhetoric, but we had so many Muslims in our school. So I never, nobody singled me out. Some of the experiences that other people, other Arabs and Muslims experience in the other parts of the country, I was spared from because I grew up in such a diverse place with lots of people from lots of different cultures. And I, and I had my 9-11, Arab American moment, I guess, when it was a 2016, in the year, in the year 2016, when there was all this anti-immigrant rhetoric about, um, you know, or surrounding the Trump election. Mm -hmm. And that was when I heard stuff like, you know, um, the, this, this narrative that Arabs were terrorists again, like bubbling up, like since like, like that was like the, maybe a giant wave of that since like 9-11 that I had felt like I noticed as a person, um, a lot of anti-Asian sentiment, like, you know, they're taking all our jobs, um, you know, you should go back to your country, um, you know, bad hombres, you remember that year, it was a horrible year. Um, and, oh yes, Mary, we, we've started. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm talking into the chat. And, um, and, you know, I was pretty, pretty surprised. I felt like I thought we were cool, America. I had like grown up thinking like nothing racist had ever happened to me because I grew up, you know, in a very special way. And so I started drawing these comics in direct reaction to like every single thing that I was seeing, you know, in the media. So like there was a time when um, that like the, the, this, this thing of like, um, you know, Muslims, they're terrorists or whatever. I drew this comic of my dad, like here's the Arab Muslim um, American who you fear. My dad wears jorts, he loves Tom Hanks and he likes eating KFC. I mean, is that scary to you? I don't know. Um, and as I was creating these comics, people react, were reacting and being like, oh my God, my dad is such a nerd too. And like, and, and they weren't just people who were Egyptians, but they were like, people who had, you know, Mexican parents or people who had, you know, Pakistani immigrant parents. And I felt like really encouraged to keep drawing. So I drew another cartoon, like my mom didn't even want to come to this country. She was fine back in the homeland. You know what I mean? Um, and so that's how the book got started uh, to answer your first question that basically, um, oh yeah, Denali, we'll talk about that soon. Um, I feel like I kept drawing those these comics and then it eventually got the notice of a um of an agent who then signed me to get my first book deal and i had never actually drawn comics formally before so i had to learn everything from scratch including how to draw on a um how to draw on a tablet so um that's how it got started the second part of your question was the joys and um challenges 
it's really hard to write about yourself. Imagine if you had to spend two years navel gazing, you're going to like find stuff about self, yourself that you didn't know and maybe you didn't even like. So um, writing to me is about discovery, discovering yourself, unearthing your feelings, exploding an idea, taking a moment and exploding it and like spending many, many pages and much time like thinking about it. And I realized that I had I, when I thought that like I hadn't experienced anything racist, that was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. I had com I had experienced so many micro microaggressions in my life, and I had internalized all those things. And I had aligned myself to whiteness because I thought that's what being American meant. Mm -hmm. So I was I, I was listening to punk music. Was I listening to punk music because I actually liked it, or because I wanted white people to like me? Mm -hmm. Like all of my interests started falling apart. Like, was I married to a white guy? Because, like, I was trained that, like, Asian guys and, like, and like uh, Arab guys were not people to look at. That that was the ideal. Like, that's my life. You know what I mean? That It starts to fall apart in your hands. And I had to go to therapy to sort of, like, unpack, like, like all the stuff that I had learned. And I was just like, uh, like, what do I do with all of this? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think you said it in just the response to your first question, there is so much packed into this book. I mean, you touched on a lot of different things, just um, uh, this view of immigrants as this monolithic group and really just kind of changing the narrative around that regarding your parents' stories, issues of colorism, issues of uh, imposter syndrome. Those are all the things like I, I framed some of the questions around. So I'm going to ask you the next one and we'll dive into some of this, but it's deep. And I already see there's a lot of chat going on. So I think there's yeah. going to be a lot of engagement later with the audience too. But um, the next question, uh, just just kind of with the beginning of the, the book, and you started by reading the, the first chapter. And I'm calling this like the Joy Luck moments, uh, Joy Luck Club moments, because just in that that simple phrase that opening where your mom says you have to be better than us i you know i break down at the beginning of that movie because of that whole story around this swan feather and you know just the story is just mo so moving and later in the story you have this moment with your father where he plays this game with you where he says a Muslim name, an American name, and you're supposed to choose. And there's, it's like this unspoken thing, but it's a very kind of, there's a very intimate moment. So kind of along that lines, you know, knowing that you're writing down these very kind of vulnerable, intimate kind of ideas, how did you feel writing this, knowing your parents and family would be reading it? Yeah, so I, I definitely, um... I want to say one thing about the book is that on the surface, it feels very light, but there's a lot of anger underneath it, like a lot of anger and frustration and confusion and like WTFing. Um, so I'm hope, and I'm, I think that that gets across. Um, uh, I think my family was really concerned when I first said to them that I wanted to write a book about them. Anybody would be concerned if, if they said like, hey, I'm writing a book about you. Is that cool with you? Because you don't know um, what they're going to write about. And I didn't know what the book was going to be about yet when I first started writing it. So you can't, I couldn't tell you if I want to write a book about you, Joe, how the ending's going to turn out, whether you're going to look good or bad, because I hadn't gone through the, the, the process of like unpacking everything. Um, you know, I should have probably reassured them a little bit more that like, look, this book is not going to, going to be make you look bad. This is about our, our journey and it's a celebration of our culture. If I had just said that, I think people would have freaked out a lot less, but people thought that I was going to like, well, don't tell people about the fact that, you know, your uncle, you know, had that drug problem. Or it's like, I'm not going to write about that. That's not even about that book. This is about me. Why, how does that, that drug problem even relate to me? That's a made up thing. It doesn't have a drug problem. Um, and then some people were like, don't write about me. I don't want you to write about me, which kind of hurt my feelings. And I spent a lot of my first few months feeling like, like crying and like thinking that like they didn't trust me. And like, in the end, I'm like, you know what, if people don't want you to write about them, don't write about them. Cause like, it's like, um, for me, some people, I don't know if you read the bad art friend article that went viral last year. If you haven't Google it, it's very interesting. Um, but 
to me, my relationships with other people are worth more than my art. So that's maybe a very Filipino thing. Like, I think that like, I wanted my mom and dad to both read the book first. And my mom was really concerned about how she was coming off. She, she remember, she's a person from the upper middle class of the Philippines. And now I made her in front of everyone. I made, I let people see that she was struggling. She was single. She had failed marriages and she, um, you know, she was basically, there's other parts later in the book where she's asking family members for money to send me to college. That's not good. That doesn't look good on her. Right. Like, but I told, and she was really, really concerned about those moments. And she said, what are my friends going to think? They're going to think I'm a failure. And then I had to also make a decision too, and be like, look, I'm sorry to say this, like, I thought about it and I was like, I felt like I really needed to say, to be honest about these aspects of our life in the book. And I told my mom, like, you are not special. You are an immigrant to America and you had to work two jobs. Look around the room, mom. Like everyone like you is literally take a number. Like you're not the only one. You're not the only special one. And she was very hesitant. But later after the book came out, she said her friends at work read the book and so many people came up to her and said how how they could see themselves in my mom Aww. that 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 they too had a very similar experience coming here other immigrant people um and my mom felt very proud to represent them you know in this book Aww. and so now she's my biggest cheerleader i went to um short run in Seattle and my mom was there tabling with me. So she's a big champion of the book. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. So of course the, the, the major theme, kind of the drive of this book is that you are identified as a Filipina raised by a practicing Catholic mother, as well as a Egyptian raised by a Muslim father. Uh, and so culture and religion is clashing. <laughs> In, in many different ways. And our, our ethnicity and religion is so intricately linked. Um, and, you know, all of these th different things are, are going on. There's, there's similarities and there's really stark differences. And I love that you actually put a chart, like a code of conduct in, in all your different um, identities right. of how to act, right? So what were some of the most difficult cultural and religious differ differences to navigate? I think that, um, first of all, I don't think being a pork loving nation jives well with having a Muslim dad. I will say that that's very, very hard. I, um, I love pork so much. I mean, that's like so horrible. I still like respectfully don't like post that I'm eating like pork, like on social media for my Muslim family members, but like, this is a lechon and spam eating nation. Okay. And like, you can't just like, pretend like that's not the case with my dad. Um, although I think he was like, he lived in blissful ignorance. Um, I think that the biggest, biggest problem was that both of my parents really, really loved their religions and they didn't communicate with each other. And spirituality is a very, very internal, internal, um, personal thing. And they didn't know about how much I was wrestling with my own spirituality in, in my mind. For people who grew up Catholic, like Catholic is a little bit like fire and brimstone, right? Like if you don't do these things, you're going to go to hell. Same thing with Islam. Like if you don't pray, like if you don't do these things, you're going to go to hell. And I was thinking this whole time, like I'm going to go to hell because like I'm lying to both of my parents who are not in communication about like what religion they should raise me. Um, they, I wish they had like made a decision. Like, look, like let's let let's forget about the Catholic thing. And like Maggie, it seems like you really want her to grow up Muslim. You win. Take it. Like. I wish I had just had that conversation instead of letting me lie to both of them. And I pretended that I was each of their religions because like I saw that it meant something really, really important to them. I didn't want to let them down. So I dutifully remember memorized like all the surahs. I learned how to pray. And like with my mom, I went to Catholic school. I got confirmed even. My confirmation name was Maria because I didn't have any Muslim name. I didn't have any Catholic name, Christian names. I had like my full name is Malika Magid Muhammad Abdul Latif Gharib. So there's nothing Christian in there. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Like, I feel like that was the hardest part. Everything else was so easy. Cake. Okay. Learning how to eat with bread versus learning how to eat with a spoon and fork. Cake. That was fine. The, the religion was hard. 
Yeah, I actually had a whole question dedicated around pork, <laughs> but you <laughs> answered that question. Yeah, and I, I guess kind of a follow up to that. Um, yeah, how so? So that happens, right? You you just kind of had to figure it out for yourself. They weren't communicating about it. So how did you manage the fallout? Like, how did you manage the disappointment yeah. or or issues around that? I think I've always very respectfully followed my parents' religions in front of them. Uh, I even code switched religion. So you can code switch all the cultural things in life, right? Like, look, when I go to an Arab party, women sit with the women, men sit with the men. All right. Like, I get that. One time my husband was with me. He was sitting with me at an Arab party. And I was like, get the heck over there. Go over there. Can't sit with the women. Um, same thing with like, you know, Filipino culture. It's like, you know, if there's a matriarch in the family, you got to do what she says, right? My aunt hated my wedding dress. She superseded my mom. We got a new wedding dress. Yeah. But um, how I lived with the religion part, because it's such a personal thing, it's not something that even if I lied in front of in front of each of them, personally, you know, I made up my own religion where I took parts of like things that I liked about my mom's religion, things that I liked about my dad's religion and mixed them up. Like, one thing that I, I love the Virgin Mary and I think that she's amazing. And I, my mom like um, is, is, she's a real pr protective uh, figure for my mom. And I grew up like praying the rosary and I find it very comforting. And I also like the pomp and circumstance of going to mass. Like I find that very comforting having gone to Catholic school too. But I also really love like the call to prayer in Muslim, in Islam. And also the fact that there's only one God in Islam. Like it's like, there are certain facets of it that I love and I kind of mix it together in my, in my life. But um, I don't mix other things, which is so weird. Like I wouldn't mix Filipino and Egyptian food, for example. I've never tried it, um, but I, yeah. Yeah, I think you, you even said something like, I made lumpia falafel. I was like, that just doesn't sound right. No, no, I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> So yes. So earlier we were we were just um, talking about you know uh, you cover a lot of really nuanced, uh, deeper issues in a lighthearted way. But there's this undertone, like there there's some anger, there's some other emotions, pain, all those things. Um, and when you were reading uh, the beginning chapter, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about colorism, right? The light skin dark skin dynamic. And uh, when you're reading the chapter, you said, oh, okay, I got the nickname Brownie because of my dark skin. You're like, oh yeah, and by the way, that's problematic. That's not in the book, right? But you just kind of added a footnote there. Yeah. Um, and also you talk about liking the light skinned boy in high school. You married a white man, okay. uh, right? There's a glossary on racially charged labels like banana where you're Asian on the outside, white on the inside. So how did, how did all of that just kind of shape your experience? Yeah, um, colorism. Well, you know, I was complimented a lot for my very light skin, which is because my dad is a Caucasian Arab. He's a blue eyed, blonde haired Egyptian man. And so are my siblings. They're very, very fair. Um, and so I was very light skinned, but um, I felt really bad for my dark skinned Filipino cousins who were constantly derided by my grandmother for, um, for their dark skin and told to stay out of the sun. And that was horrible for them, but I always felt very special and which was just like a horrible thing to happen, like a dynamic to grow up with. Um, and my dad also, the fact that my dad called me a pet name based on my skin color, which he, I was brown compared to him. That's extremely problematic. Um, I don't know what to say about that. I find I, I find like it's very hard to change old generations. Like I can't change the way that like my grandparents and my parents think, but I can certainly change my own. And um, I definitely do not try to perpetuate those types of comments in my daily life with my any of my Filipino or Egyptian family. Yeah, it was horrible to grow up with that, but I felt like um, I was spared for my own skin tone, but not my other family members, which is awful. Mm -hmm. And that is tr internalized, right? It's yeah. like, and that actually my next question, uh, I wanted to talk about imposter syndrome and, you know, either you're, you're, you're um, trying to find ways to validate your brownness 
right? Or oh, yeah. you're in other situations and you're trying to hide things about your culture. And that came up uh, in your memoir. But um, just this idea of feeling like you don't fit in or that you're being fake. There's a point where you're called a poser by mm -hmm. your classmates and that really hurt you. But just this idea of like, am I American enough? Am I Filipino enough? Am I Arab enough? Am I Muslim enough? All of those things. Um, how did you ultimately come to term with this internal conflict? Yeah, um, I think that how did I ultimately come to terms with my internal conflict? I think that ultimately in the book, I had a really, really hard time accepting the, my dad always told me, you have an American passport. You're an American. What's the problem? And to me, that always fundamentally showed me that my parents had no clue about the identity challenges that their offspring would face in this country. They had no idea. They had literally no idea what kind of impact that would have. You don't just come here, have a kid, and then like you're American. That doesn't. It doesn't work like that. And and that was the thing that my parents took away from this book. I, we didn't know how hard it was for you. We thought that when you we came here, you would have a better life than us. I certainly did have a better life than them, for sure. Like, like I went to a great school, I have a great job, I didn't have to worry about come, like arriving to a new country to learn a new language and like set up my life. I didn't have to worry about that thanks to them. But the problems that I face are different. It's about acceptance and um, it's about assimilation and it's about um, belonging. And my American dream is totally different from their American dream. Their American dream is, I always felt was more material to have these landmarks of, of having a certain salary level, having a certain ability to give back to their own families and having um, some feeling of settlement. Like we've got a house or we you know, have put our kids in good schools. My American dream was really about feeling like I even fit in and belonged in this place. And for me, I just wanted to get to the sentence, I'm, I, I am American too. I, I'm American too. I, people will say that to me, but it takes work to believe that. If you literally, if you're a, a, an immigrant child and you think about that sentence, I am an American, do you actually feel that? Do you 100% feel that? Like, I wanted to like unpack all the feelings around that. And at the end of the book, I did come to a place where I felt like I freaking deserve to be called an American. Like my, my experience is an example of what it means to live in America. I am a person who I have a right to be here because I grew up here. And this little slice, this little Filipino Egyptian slice of life of, in Southern California growing up there, that is also the American experience. I am an American too. That's where I landed with this book. Yeah. And actually in the comments, someone said earlier that in a lot of immigrant families, American is synonymous with white because of those images. And, you know, I, I had to, my mom still, you know, when she's talking about an American person, she's talking about a white person. And, you know, and just what you described, that this is the American experience. I want to remind folks in the audience that we're going to be taking questions soon. What would be super helpful is if you put your questions and ask a question box. I, I will try to go through the chat, but it's really helpful if, if you put your questions there. So just giving you a heads up. Um, let's see. Well, you know, you can't talk about being mixed race without talking about the question, what are you? And you know, what What really surprised me um, in, in reading your book was that what are you had this positive connotation because of where you grew up, because of where it was so diverse. And I that's how you found out things. How did you mix up somebody from El Salvador with somebody from like Colombia or Honduras? Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid. Right. Have it's normalized, right? It's normalized asking, right? Right. And then I was like, oh, that was so not my experience. I had this like, oh, I, I kind of dread that question. But you do circle back and talk about the nuance of that question and how different people have different connotations. Um, so just wanted to yeah. talk about that a little bit. And what was that evolution for you? Well, let me say this. I think that the most radical thing that you can do right now in this country is to scream from the rooftops who you are as a person. Mm. 
and own it. What is so wrong with saying that like to own and be part, like they don't want us to like say it. So why can't, like, I want to say it. Like, I, I want to show people that this is what this looks like. This is what a immigrant child, mixed race person looks like. You thought you had some ideas about Muslims? Think again. You had some ideas about Asian people? Think again. I, I am very proud to say who I am in a space that's safe, of course. If I'm in a, an unsafe space and somebody weird is trying to, like, I don't, you know when you're in a safe space. And if, if you're in, if you're not in a safe space, do whatever you want. But like, if you're in a safe space, it's a very radical act to be who we are is in our ethnicity. Think about that. I, I actually had written, a, um, I draw zines and comics and I wrote one recently about how, um, how important it was for me that, that, that being who we are is a radical act. Never forget that. I love that. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, we have a few questions from the audience. So I'm going to check those out now. Um, oh, yes. The, the presidential elections are happening now in the Philippines. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And thank you for being here. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I actually can't disclose my political beliefs because I am a journalist at NPR. So I cannot disclose it. Like literally, I can't say anything about any topic um, or any election or any anything. So I have to pass on that question. Sure. The next question is, what advice do you have for youth today who, like you, have either immigrated at a young age or have immigrant parents? Um, I think that that you should spend your some time thinking about how you actually feel being your ethnicity. What does it mean to you being Chinese American? Do you feel proud about it? Do you feel ashamed? Do you feel kind of um, resentful? Do you feel really excited by it? And start to think about like why you might be feeling those things. Do you feel proud because your parents you know, told you a lot of stories about your homeland and like, you know, got you involved in your culture. If so, that's a great place to be. If you feel ashamed, try to dig a little deeper. Are you ashamed because you think that it's because um, it's it's not normal to be your ethnicity or that people would see you differently if they, if, if you know, they knew what your ethnicity was. You don't feel safe to be your ethnicity. You know, start to dig and question how you feel about it. Because if you do that, you'll save yourself years of therapy. And also it'll, it'll help you understand a little bit more about where you are in your identity journey. I think all of us ultimately go on an identity journey. Mine happened very late in life. I, I had my identity journey at the age of 29. I went through a whole entire life in America thinking like, oh, like whatever, it's race, whatever, I'm Filipino Egyptian, ha. Ah. But only then did I really think like, oh no, like I have so, a lot of, of work I need to do. So if you could start it early, know how you feel about your identity and question it and talk about it with other people who you feel safe with talking to. Thank you. Kind of relatedly, um... Uh, an audience member asked, do you know of any community colleges, and I'll expand that, any schools that are using your novel? They specifically asked about in ESOL or ESL classes, uh, but just wondering because of that, you know, that we need to talk to young folks, right? We need to find ways to to talk about this, normalize these conversations. Is your is your book being used? Yeah, it's being, um, it's being taught at so many universities and so many high schools. It's been co common, common reads for like a lot of schools and um, shocking to me because I thought nobody would read this book. So I'm very, very relieved. Um, but I recently had a chance to do to speak at a um, middle school um, ESL program and um, the kids were wild. Uh, they mostly wanted to, they were mostly from a Middle Eastern background, a Middle Eastern Muslim background, and only wanted to know about my thoughts and beliefs on uh, Islam, uh, which I was happy to answer. Um, but it was really cute, and it was really nice to hear what they thought about my story. They were very interested in Darren, how he was not Muslim, 
Um, so it's really interesting how different um, communities, what they latch on to. These kids obviously are very interested in the Arab Muslim aspects. Um, and, um, you know, just by their nature, had a lot of thoughts about, had a lot of questions about my own spirituality. So that was very important to them. Thank you. And uh, I just learned in the chat that the person asking the question is a dean for an ESOL program. So oh, that's cool. what they had asked. Well, yes. yeah. it's, uh, it's been used a lot, especially because uh, people say that because uh, it's a picture book, it's very it's much easier to like grasp the, the messaging. I'm sure you've heard that in your own um, teachings. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. So this is ask, this question is asking you to use your imagination. Could you imagine a different upbringing if it was in a whiter community? Oh no, oh, I think I'd have a harder time. I actually, actually, hearing um, in writing this book, I've heard from so many different kinds of people um, from all kinds of different backgrounds, and um, I even have met many Filipino Egyptians along the way many different permutations. I, I actually identify more as Egyptian. I, I identify more as, you know, uh, uh, I grew up with, you know, my white mom, uh, uh, you know, and my and my dad is the one who's Filipino Egyptian. So we get all these different mixes, right? And definitely, I would say people of color growing up in white communities, they have it much harder. I mean, they're singled out for who they are in different ways. I do want to say that growing up in an immigrant community like I did, I still felt singled out because I was this very particular mix. I wasn't quite Filipino and I wasn't quite Arab, so I couldn't hang out with the Arab people because I wasn't Arab enough. So I had my own different issues of belonging, but there I really feel, I feel like I feel really like, I, I don't know. I mean, people in the chat, if you grew up in a white community or even Joe, if you, you did, I'd love to hear your thoughts actually on this. Well, similar to you, um, where I grew up was pretty racially diverse, but when I did go away to college, um, it was a predominantly white um, school and area. And I was actually going to ask you this about Syracuse. Um, so when I went to college and, and felt that sense of isolation and needing to see people that I could connect with, I found the Ethnic Student Center and we had a number of student clubs and we organized together. We helped each other with our events, like helping people with the luau or with the low rider show, you know? So we, we did a lot of um, things together like that and it really so, helped find community. And so I was wondering, did you find something like that at Syracuse or? I didn't even know that I wanted to be Asian until I was 30, <laughs> as I told you, Joe. I like literally was like, white people all the way um, until like, I was like 30 and I was like, wait a second, wait, my cousin, Raham, who's Egyptian, visited me and she was like, where are all your brown friends? And I was like, what are you talking about brown friends? And I was like, oh no, I don't have any. So I quickly like um, started, I found my Kamabaya and I like found the Filipino group in DC. I like joined like the, I started taking Arabic classes. I literally doubled down on like becoming my culture like within like two years. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm so glad that you found it early on in college. That's wonderful, Joe. Yeah. Yes, you did mention the cycle of socialization. That part, that that part of your identity, where you did did you ever did you have your militant stage? Did you what militant there? stage? Do I have to have one? I don't know if I want to have one. <laughs> where you just start reading all the books that oh. weren't taught in school. Oh my god! Hyper. I'm looking at America is in the heart right now by Carlos mm. Cusan. So yes, I definitely have that stage. <laughs> All right, so um, letting folks know if you have some additional questions, please do pop them in. Uh, I see one more here. Do you have any advice uh, to my understanding in my language? I'm not ashamed to be Asian, but I feel like it's hard to interact with my family who takes Chinese as their first language while I take English as my first. Well, that is a really, really good question. And I think Denali, was that you who asked that question? Yes. Um, there, I actually think that um, there's a game called Parents Are Human, and it was it was started by a Chinese American person here in the United States, and it's it's a set of questions that really geared toward your understanding your parents and humanizing them as people, and they're questions like, um, you know, what are your hopes and dreams for me? But they're also translated into 
Chinese, they translate it into Tagalog, they translate it into, um, you know, Korean, they have it in all different languages. And the, basically the gist of the game is like, you can show your parents like the question and, and it's in English, but it's also in your, in their, in their language. And they can sort of answer, they can sort of understand what the game, what the question is truly, and then try to answer it from the heart. And it's a wonderful way. I've, I've, I've been a huge fan of this game. It's a wonderful way to see your immigrant parents as beyond as just being these like, you know, sometimes we see immigrant parents as like, oh, they don't understand the language very well. So they're kind of stupid or like they don't get it. You know, that's, that's not the case. It's not that they don't get it. It's like, well, they may not get some things, but because they're our parents. It's not that they don't get it. It's just like there's a language barrier. And like we, we are very sensitive um, as immigrant kids to that. So um, anyway, I got the game. I love it. I hope that you get the game too, Denali. I think you'll really like it. It's called Parents Are Human. Parents are human. I have to check that out. Yes, please do. And so let's see. Someone in the chat mentioned that they did order your new book. It's pre-ordered. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Speaking of, this is actually a perfect segue because um, what, like, here's my thing. Growing, I spent every single, almost every single summer of my life in Egypt, right? And one year when I um, came to Egypt, my dad told me that he had actually remarried and I had a new stepmom who did not speak English. She literally spoke like very, very, very little English. And now I had this new woman in my life and I had to make a relationship with her. And this book is about how I ended up making a relationship with my stepmom over the course of 15 years from age nine to 25. I can't do math. Is that 15 years? Um, making a relationship with my stepmom and ultimately learning about myself, my stepmom, Egypt, and how I fit in with this blended family. Uh -huh. And uh, it's called It Won't Always Be Like This. And um, I learned that it's possible to make really, really deep relationships with people without language. You don't need language to make relationships with people. Um, and it's evident in the relationships I made with my stepmom and my siblings, my half siblings in the Middle East. And it's not about identity. This book isn't about identity as much as it is Built feeling belonging, but in a blended family. And it just so happens to take place in the Middle East, in the home of a Muslim family. Um, so it really, I feel like the Middle East, like it feels like the Wild West for a lot of people, but this book hopefully is an intimate look inside this. Um, actually, if you can go to a comic shop anytime, uh, an indie comic shop, it was free comic book day last weekend. And you can get a preview of the first two chapters. Um, it looks like this. So if you go to your indie comic book shop and just say like, hey, do you have any leftovers from free comic book day? I'm looking for it won't always be like this. You can probably find it. So it looks a little bit like this. That's a preview. Yeah. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about creating a comic, creating a graphic novel? Can you can you speak to just kind of like the process of that? Well, I have to say that like, I had literally never made real comics until I got the book deal. I was frightened and scared out of my mind. I hadn't, I'd read comics like in my twenties and I read a few when I was, you know, in my teens, I read ghost world. I read, um, you know, a lot of Adrian Tomina books, um, like killing and dying. Um, I read a lot of indie comics, but, but, um, I hadn't spent, I, I wasn't like, like, a big, big comics reader and fan. So when I got this book deal, they were like, all right, well, we just want you to draw the whole entire book um, and it should be a linear story, okay? So like from beginning to end, you have 160 pages. And I was like, oh my God, I have literally no idea how to do that. Uh -huh. I was terrified. And so I just kind of faked it, which is why there's like, I did the best I could do. It feels like the book has a lot of games in it. And I think I wanted to just feel like an illustrated diary. Um, but this next time around, I did a more formal like comic book style comic like, like this. Um, and that's because I learned a lot about comics in the two years I was working on it. 
I was their American dream. Um, I quickly, like, when I got the book deal, I, like, read Mouse and Persepolis, and I was like, nope, can't do this. Like, too hard. That, like, I'll never be able to do this, like, at this level. Um, so I was like, I'm never reading any more graphic novels for this time period because it makes me feel too intimidated. Uh. Um, but I, I, I eventually figured it out. And actually, after uh, drawing I Was Their American Dream got me into, um, like, the formal mechanics of comics. It's, I started my education in comics came after the book. So then that's when I had my, my militant moment and started like, um, you know, reading books like this, uh, Will Eisner's comics and sequential art. And I, I sort of had this, this formal education then going back and learning like what are supposed to happen in panels and like pacing, timing, dialogue, um, you know, what you're supposed to, you know, how you're supposed to format a dialogue box but ultimately, here's what I learned about comics. And this is what I love about it. Comics is like poetry, okay? Like the dialogue, the narration, and the image are all doing three separate things, but together they tell you one whole picture. So you might have a couple, one person is giving the other end a, a flower, but the narration above it says, I hate you. So it changes the image, like the changes your inter interpretation of the image. Like it's not like this lovey-dovey scene, but like something else. And so um, your brain has to work to fill in all the gaps of information that you're trying to communicate with these three elements. And it feels like a puzzle. And that feels really challenging and fun to me. I do have to say, I did enjoy that interactive piece. And that's why I'm glad I have my own copy because where you say, cut this out here and <laughs> use this. I, mean, it, I love that aspect of it. So folks, if you are if you are going to purchase the book, you can do that too. Uh, don't do the ones to, don't do that to the ones you check out from the library, of course, mm -hmm. but you can get your own copy. But um, that's, that's a really um, fascinating to hear that process for you. We actually last, yesterday uh had the opportunity to interview huda fami who wrote huda oh, after yeah. you yeah mm -hmm. and her session was all about the creative process so it's interesting to hear yours uh, oh, i wonder yeah. uh, hopefully folks in the audience were able to to see her presentation oh i'm so but, excited for to read her book yeah. yes but it's like i was like oh my gosh another egyptian author of comics that is awesome so speaking of uh, why does why does that representation matter? Because I'm I'm sure there's not a whole lot of folks uh, who share your identity in this world. Uh, and what would you tell young folks who want to write and be artists? Oh yeah, I actually you know a big a big um, a big mission of mine is that anybody can make comics like anybody i'm not i wasn't even an art i mean i wasn't really a real artist like before i did the, the comics like anybody can do it like it doesn't it's not it's not you don't really need in comics it's about the expression of, of, of how you can express yourself with the line with drawing something if you draw like a heart and it's all like squiggly and kind of messed up that's how you feel that day right like that's how your heart feels you know it's very expressive um and I also believe that every person has their own story. So a lot of the workshops that I do with kids are actually, let's make a mini zine together about your family history. Um, tell me about your parents' dreams for you. What's your dream for yourself? What are some things that you grew up with doing in your life, your family traditions? What do you want to take with you? What do you, what do you want to let go? Why? Um, and when people do these, when kids do these workshops, they get really into it. And even if it's like, no matter what background they are, whether they're white or black or like, you know, Asian or Hispanic, like everybody has their, everybody's family is so unique and they get really into, into it. And it's really cute. And, um, I've had some workshops that I've done where it was actually the, the, the first, this, this workshop that we did was like the first step into like a longer series of, of, um, like, like a longer project where they would have to like write more intimately about themselves. So it was like an icebreaker sort of event. Uh, anyway, everyone has a story to share and I challenge you to say yours. I actually have some templates on Twitter. Um, maybe I'm going to find them in the next question and, um, and I'll drop it into the chat. That sounds great. I mean, maybe we'll need to do a workshop in the future. I know. 
<laughs> and so, and also you mentioned you're coming back to Seattle in August and yes. folks, uh, now that we all know each other a little bit better, if you want to drop your recommendations, places to eat, places to stay, yes. please do put that in the chat and we'll make sure that we send them to Malika. Uh, Jerry Ventura, hey girl, do it, yes. <laughs> yeah. So we are about a minute out. I wanna see if there's any last remaining questions from the audience while you're looking for that link. Oh, I found it. It's um, it's actually for Asian American Heritage Month, so I put it in the, um, it, which is now, so I put it in yes. the chat. It's like a template on why you love being Asian. Awesome, perfect, yeah. thank you. Well, with that, um, I think we're going to wrap, but thank you so much for your time. It was such fun talking to you. Um, and Jeff is going to give us a few more outro yeah. information. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks to everyone um, for, for being with us tonight. Um, as a remind a reminder, you can purchase I Was There American Dream from Third Place Books at the link at the bottom of the screen. And there's also a place to click below if you would like to donate to the KCLS Foundation to support our author events. And of course, you can also borrow um, I Was There American Dream from KCLS. I'm going to pop that in the chat. And I'm also going to put um, a link to the survey again. Uh, please let us know what you think and if there are authors you'd like to hear from in the future or, or programs that you would enjoy. That. And um, uh, finally, if you'd like to look for upcoming events on our social media, uh, if you go to kcls.org yeah, kcls forward slash author voices, um, our programs are listed there and then also on our KCLS social media. Um, Thank you again for being here tonight. This was just wonderful. And uh, I hope everyone has uh, a pleasant evening. And um, um, thank you again. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. This was so fun. Um, be my friend on Twitter and Instagram. Peace out. Awesome.